Welcome back to another episode of A Very British Space Program. The UK is celebrating the triumphant return to Earth of Kim Jarvis, the first person to orbit Earth and return. But we can't rest on that. We've got to keep going. We've got to keep ahead. So let's go. It is um, the 17th of March 1961 and we are launching the first of our early commercial communication satellites from Australia, from, uh, from our site in Australia. This is on a Red Princess 4C and it's been a while since we've actually had Australia use its 60 ton pad. Um, but it's all part of the program of getting Australia back on its feet. It's had a number of, uh, shall we say, less than suitable sort of flights recently. It's um, it's lost a Venus probe. It's had moon lander issues. So it's felt that we need to just get the, the things working there, at least at the basic level. So this Red Princess is just going to go up into orbit. It's a, it's a workhorse for us now. And I'm sure the Australians can't do anything wrong with this one. We're hoping that we can get a bit of cash for this because we ask, we're a bit cash starved at the moment although we've put a, uh, a person in orbit we've used a lot of our science to do that we've used a lot of our money to do that we've got a lot of upgrades to do if we want to keep pushing forward we have to spend a lot of money on actually pushing forward with not just our tech but actually with our facilities so the red princess puts this uh, this commercial craft just into orbit we use our rcs systems just to sort out the orbit exactly how it's supposed to be well and close enough and uh, we are done. And we follow that up straight away on the 30th of March, 1961, by putting in a, a first communications system to avoid uh, a blackout around the, uh, the the low Earth orbit region. At the moment, we are risking a lot of a lot of problems in that area. So we're launching up a Trident One Air rocket, and on top of it, we are sending up not one, not two, not three, but four Skynet One satellites. Um, this is partly military, obviously, technology. Um, it is using our Newton 1A bus that we used for the EOS probes and we've used for our geostationary pro contracts. And that's gonna actually be there for putting them into a suitable uh, resonance orbit. And then the probes themselves, the satellites themselves are on the top there. So you can actually see we've got, we're using the, uh, the, uh, the, the Newton 1A bus on the top there and on the top of it is four, four satellites all side by side there. So we're just gonna take that up into a nice orbit. We're gonna use the, and you can see that we have no problems with this launch at all. The the Trident is is doing well. The Trident 1A is a, a it, it has its moments and it's had its moments in, in the recent history, but it is a good craft. It just, um, sometimes you've got to double up on things. So we take that up and uh, it is going up for a nice simple simple orbit to start with we're trying to you know get a system into orbit to try and just augment our communications and we'd really love it if this was uh, was was going to be equatorial but our primary concern is actually just getting a system up there that's going to allow us communication and we have a contract for it so money is always good for this so we're going to carry out our burn using our little transfer stage the uh, the Newton one air transfer stage that's going to take it up to an uh, an an altitude that we can actually use for, for generating our resonance orbit there. So we're gonna turn it around. We're using our row engine, row one and uh, row 101 engine, just to, to pump it up there. And again, this is another, uh, another peroxide and uh, fuel engine. So we're gonna use that, fires off there. RP-1 peroxide is, is basically our fuel of choice right now. And um, we're trying to, trying to keep using it because it's very much a British system. So we get up there, we've got, got and you see the, the RCS system on that is not brilliant. It's a, it overfires a little bit, but we, we seem to have managed it. Now, this orbit is quite inclined, and um, the concern there is that it's gonna limit our ability to actually get signals. So we, we're gonna use the fact that we've got a relightability on that, that row engine um, to try and just fix that just a smidge. And we're gonna use a, a sum of our, um, our power to, to fix that. And what we're trying to do is actually bring us into that resonance orbit, but also just do a slight sort of correction to the inclination. Uh, so we're going to use the excess, in effect, the excess fuel from putting us into our resonance orbit to change the inclination at the same time, a bit like you would do with geostationary orbits. That's what we're going to try and do. And of course, there we go, fire the engine off. Wonderful. And we have an engine failure. Brilliant. So we're just going to use the RCS system because it uses the same fuel because, you know, we're... We, 
using a bit of redundancy there the rcs is not as efficient though as those row engines and so we're basically carrying that row engine up into orbit for very little reason now we're just carrying dead weight so we're going to burn through that rcs of course the big problem with that is that um well it, it's not as efficient it's not as quick either so we're actually going past our burn point and you can see we actually decide to give up on changing inclination we're just going to try and get this into the resonance orbit that it needs to be in and it's going to take a few passes instead of using that big powerful row engine we're just going to use rcs on multiple passes and we're hoping that we actually have enough fuel for this to get it into this resonance uh, pattern I th we, th we think we do, we think we do, and I'm going to be honest with you, I could have got the uh, the pen and paper out and done a bit of calculations on the back of a, a napkin, as it were, um, on the on whether we've got the Delta V based on the uh, ISP of the R RCS system, there's a lot of acronyms going on there, um, but uh, we felt we had it, so so we, we gave up on the whole inclination change and went straight just for we need to just get into the required orbit for our resonance at the moment we know that those 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 satellites on the top there have enough delta v to fix their resonance orbit once they're released but we've got to get them there first so next step is just release them so we're going to release them all one after the other make sure that they slide past each other we don't want them bumping into each other and causing damage they're really tightly packed in there very long and thin they carry um, some communication payload that is required for the contract as well as their own communication system uh, um, and some sort of uh, avionic system and some fuel in the bottom tank there for them to run their little tiny thrusters um, they do have some ability to, to rotate themselves with small RCS nozzles and of course there we go so we're just going to see a bit of uh, positioning here so we're, what we're doing is every time that one of these goes round the planet they're going to circularize themselves they're going to burn 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 but well impulse they're going to impulse their engines and put themselves hopefully into a, uh, a suitable orbit which is circular and we're going to try and set the time for all those orbits about the same now again in an ideal world, we'd be designing these this system specifically for us, but we've got a contract from the military to do this, so we're, we're fulfilling that contract. And you can see there the the outer orbit is what we're actually doing. We're doing we, we were currently in a bit of a dive orbit, and we're actually going to circularize higher up. So it's not the most efficient for these individual craft, but it works out uh, because of the fuel usage on the on the sort of carrier stage. So we, we we've we've rescued it a little bit. Um, and there we go, that's number two. And of course, at the end of each time, we uh, tend to rename them, give them their name system, but we also put them into the normal orientation so that they can always get some sort of sunlight as they pass towards the, the sun. So onto the third one, and it is a case of just rinse and repeat with this. The same with all satellite constellation type things that you do in, uh, in the world, obviously. Luckily, we're not putting a GPS system because that would be a bit of a killer. And so there we go, we're just going to do this one, it orientates itself, it's going to fire its engines, use up all the fuel it can there. It's actually got a lot of fuel left over. We use about half of what we, we had with us. Uh, the, the rest is, is, you know, for orientation, things like that. We had a, a decent safety margin actually on these and these satellites in the end, which we didn't expect to have. So um, that was a, a big positive actually for this mission. And, uh, and then we come on to our final one and we do the same thing again. And this now gives us pretty much a communication system in orbit of the planet. And this should, the aim of this was to help us with communication. One slight problem, we may not have actually got the whole antenna situation as right as we had hoped. The tech level was slightly off, shall we say. And the antenna strengths are not as good as we'd have hoped. So while we're gonna complete this contract for the military, we are debating on how efficient this is going to be in actually supporting our communications and we're probably going to have to put up another system in the future dedicated specifically for us to use as opposed to the military component of uh, of the uk so here we are this craft is basically just refining itself just a little bit there and you can see we're renaming it you can see the position of them they're all in four corners and you'll notice they're all able to communicate with the ground stations but they're not communicating with each other because we have a slight, slightly weaker signal than we aimed for. And so, yeah, they're going to act as basically uh, relays in orbit, but not perfect. We're not going to have a, a perfect communication system. So after that, we need more money because we're going to have to start doing some stuff for ourselves. So it is 
the 5th of April in 1961. We're really firing out these missions and we have another Red Princess going up. This time, this is our second commercial communications contract. Um, and this one is, is requiring us to carry 400 units of payload into an inclined orbit. Um, this is really pushing the, the, the Red Princess actually. Um, and at this point, we're actually looking at what is the next upgrade point for this. We This, this craft on average, it weighs around 50 tons and we've got a 60 ton pad that we can launch it from. So we've got quite a bit of weight to play with. So we may look at some strap on boosters. We may look at uh, increasing the second stage, but then we are limited on thrust on our first stage. Um, we have reduced the number of engines there actually as this craft's evolved because we've got greater efficiency but it's likely that we'll probably look at redeveloping the craft and improve that upper stage as well with some restart ability because we, we like that uh, that option but we get it into the correct orbit and and there we go done and then we fire another one off so this is going from spade adam um, and this is uh, on the 8th of april 1961 so three days later we've launched in australia we're now launching from spade adam in the uk this is going into a, an almost polar orbit we're actually looking at an inclination of about 95 to 100 degrees and at around a thousand kilometers circular and this is going to be the the a second generation commercial weather contract uh, and this is this is um you know the first of these for us so what we're, we're you know being british we, we love the weather we uh, we think it's very important and obviously some of the some of the organizations in the uk have decided that they need improved um weather control so just as we're finishing off our orbit we actually get news from the that the ussr is preparing another big launch and we wonder if this is possibly in response to our uh, our um having kim jarvis in orbit about a month ago so we, we're we're going to be watching that in great detail to see what actually it is um, that they're actually launching it. It seems as though um, there's a lot of sort of bustle going on around that that launch in the USSR at the moment. We don't see any transfer windows coming up, so we're wondering whether it's either a lunar contract or they may they may be putting another another you know animal into orbit because they seem to like doing that and then not bringing them back. We 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 do wonder whether they may have something for the human side of things. So. 26th of April 1961 we're launching our second commercial navigation satellite into high inclined orbit so we've got another one of these this, this, this whole period of about two months has just been launching multiple multiple money making craft into orbit we're just all about trying to get as much money and bang for our buck as possible at the moment so both launch sites have basically been firing these things off as quickly as they could develop them now we've got this craft basically nailed down in its form and we know its limitations it's basically been rolling out onto the pad every few weeks um so we're, we're hoping that that's uh, we can start getting some cash in um what we have got um, since since our last launch was uh, was news that we were correct about uh, the the USSR getting quite busy around a particular launch. It seems that on the twelfth of April, nineteen sixty one, um, they placed their first male into orbit. So they have the first male in orbit and return in the form of Yuri Gagarin. He um, he was up there for he he was the second person to orbit the planet. Um, first man to orbit the planet we don't have that first they do hold that which is uh, um, is a little annoying for us and obviously you know um, first woman's one thing but first man well you know that, that shows you've definitely progressed as a nation doesn't it um, so it seems that the USSR's launch capability really does match ours and and we've got to keep going because they're gonna keep pushing us so with that in mind it is the 12th of May 1961 and uh, EOS 1A, the surviving EOS 1 craft, has made its way into the sphere of influence of Venus. It's going to do a little bit of correction of its route now using some of the RTS that's uh, installed on the craft. We're, we've still got radio signal with it at the moment so we can actually communicate and control it. It's weak. We have limited upload and download capability but we are able to send commands we are able to get basic information back from it so we're using its rcs to basically um 
refine its orbit, bring it in as close as possible to that atmosphere. We want to try and get, we've got a lot of science on board this craft, we want to try and get from our television cameras and from our our sensors and, and you know photo sensors and all sorts of things. We've got thermometers, we've got pressure gauges, we've got magnetometers, we've got radiation sensors, we've got everything we currently have on this craft. It is loaded up with science equipment and we need to get it, number one, as close to Venus as possible. Number two, we need it to be there as long as possible. So we set it off, we've refined its orbit and we just let it fly, let it fly through. We are not sure about signal when we get near the planet. We, we don't know about magnetic fields and how that might interfect, you know, affect it. We also know that we're likely to have a period of blackout near the planet when it's being obscured from Earth. So around the 14th of May, 1961, EOS 1A passes very close to Venus. It is skimming, skimming the atmosphere. We do have some signal as it starts to approach and we start to, uh, as it becomes closer and closer to its periaps, we refine again its route. We are basically trying to make sure that this craft, trying to get it to stay around Venus as long as possible. We've got a bit of fuel left on the craft. We know this thing isn't coming back to Earth, but we can use some of that fuel to just slow it down just enough so that we can stay in this sphere of influence just a few minutes longer, just to get as much information as possible as we skim across the surface of, or the, or just above the atmosphere of Venus. The data we're getting back is very confusing. It, it, it seems very thick and dense atmosphere there. It doesn't, it doesn't really match our image of Venus being another another version of Earth. It's it just it seems very odd it doesn't match up that the temperatures we're getting just can't be quite right there must be something going on so we're gonna to have to investigate that again because we know it's closer to the sun we know it's going to get more heat from the sun but it doesn't account for the actual the readings we're getting it just seems everything seems off the scientists are very confused they're gonna to have to spend a long time analyzing the data and we have got a lot of data coming back right now you can see there um, we have a lot of data that's actually being trawled and sent back to Earth as the uh, as the transmitters are able to get through it. We have a lot of data to come back. It's going to take a while, but we have the electricity. We have the transmission capability. This craft is always going to stay within range of, of Earth. We don't have to worry about what we've got with the EOS 2 craft. So we're going to try and get as much information from this as possible. And we also need to start thinking about our next mission to Venus because next time I think we're going to need to stay there for a while. So as we float off away from the uh, our sister planet, until next time, have a great one.